Wimber Pride Arts and Entertainment, take one. Hello and welcome to the Winberg Pride Arts and Entertainment Show. My guest today is Ron Cavanaugh uh -huh. and Troy Johnson. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Ron, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm uh, Ron Cavanaugh, president of MosaicBooks.com. Mosaic Books is an online marketing company, and we market mainly self-published, small publishers, and a few large publishers. Um, you know, when they come out with new books, they're looking for different avenues and different markets and people that they can reach. And uh, oftentimes they come directly to us uh, to kind of help do promotion and marketing for their new books. Okay, Troy? Well, I'm, Ron, I'm the president and founder of the African American Literature Book Club, AALBC.com. And it's uh, the largest and, and one of the oldest websites dedicated to promoting uh, books by and about black folks. Um, we publish uh, articles, book reviews, uh, uh, celebrity interviews, we sell books, and um, we, we sell advertising to advertisers who are also interested in reading, reaching readers of uh, African American literature. Um, so that's, that's the main thing that we do. Okay, yeah. both of you gentlemen um, have functions that you have. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, it, it's so interesting because when I started MosaicBooks.com, it was su such a kind of new environment back in 1996. And since then, every year, or every couple of years, there's been some kind of major shift or new direction you have to go in. And right now, for the past year or so, we've really been trying to uh, incorporate more social media uh, using Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and all these different tools that kind of allow people to interact with you more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So trying to put all of these different tools together and then present them back to buyers and book lovers and booksellers and publishers. And, you know, publishers oftentimes, as Troy knows, lag behind everyone else. You know, like the bigger the company, the slower they are to respond to different changes. So one of the, like, the big challenges right now is just to convince publishers, and some smaller publishers also, that social media, using YouTube, using Twitter, using Facebook, is so important uh, to your marketing strategy. So that's what we're really, really focused on right now. Okay, excellent. Troy? Yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. I mean, one of the, perhaps my single biggest challenge is staying on top of technology. And as Ron mentioned, uh, these web 2.0 uh, yeah. utilities and tools and um, has changed the landscape of the, of the World Wide Web. We have a, a website like Facebook that Ron just mentioned uh, that purports to have over 400 million registered users. Uh, globally, that's more people in the in the, in the population of this, of this country. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I mean, those, that's that's astonishing. And so what we're trying to do, what we do, is utilize these tools, or, and try to figure out how to use these tools to benefit our businesses. And one of the tools that we use a great deal is Facebook. Um, you know, we are able to, with Facebook and some of the tools that it provides, reach people that we wouldn't have been able to reach ordinarily, uh, but we're, and we're also <coughs> able to reach them immediately. Yeah. So, you know, when I used to publish a book review, for example, the, I would make people aware of the book review by sending out a newsletter, and people would read the newsletter and hopefully click the link. Once a month. Wait. And and my newsletter only went out once a month. Right. Other than that, there might there might be an organic search where people are looking for that specific review or the author. Um, but it took time for the search engines to index these pages, and hopefully someone would do the query and find the page. Uh, but today, whenever I publish new content, I put that up on Facebook, linking back to my site, saying, here's some content. I put it up on Facebook. I put it up on YouTube. So we immediately those pages are viewed. Mm -hmm. And see, these are viewers that I wouldn't have been able to receive uh, so quickly 
previously. Yeah. Um, and, and there's also, you know, integrating some of the, um, the ability to share content. So all of the ALBC pages, for example, give you the ability to tweet the page, share it with Facebook, or any number of these other platforms like Dig, Dig Stumble and so Upon, forth. and you know what's so interesting about Facebook and Twitter also is how they've expanded our audiences. You know, for, I started uh, MosaicBooks.com in '96. Uh, and we're just kind of plodding along, you know, building subscribers. We also have a newsletter that we send out weekly. Uh, so we're building, 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 and we, we have about maybe 15,000 people names now. But then all of a sudden, Facebook and Twitter come, and in the course of like a year or two, we've almost, well, my audience has increased by about 50%. You know, uh -huh. when you consider it took 14 years to get to one spot, and then in two years, we've almost increased 50%. Just uh, people can subscribe to us on Facebook now. Um, you know, they can subscribe to my tweets. Uh, similar to what Troy does, we send out all this information directly to people. We no longer have to wait for a schedule. Like, so once a month or once a week. The minute you, if Dal Jenkins has a book and he wants to promote it, we can do it. The, you know, the minute you send me the cover, Mm -hmm. I can send it out to the world. Right. So, and, and trying to keep track of that or keep up with that has just been like a major challenge now, because mm -hmm. uh, so many people are are kind of coming into this space. And even though we're leaders, we're still having to carve out like through all of these different people now that hey, we're the leader. We have the um, the audience and the following and the expertise. So just to push to all these different audiences is really, I, I love it, but it is definitely a challenge. I love it because it's just, um, it's growing so fast mm -hmm. and it's so new and yeah. it's just so interesting, you know. Yeah, yeah and, and in addition to that, we, uh, there are companies like Bitly, for example. I have a, I use a customized version of Bitly. What it's, what's, it's called a URL shortener. And essentially you could take these long, unwieldy URLs and shorten them to something that's, you know, easy to remember. Mm -hmm. uh, but in addition to that, you can track uh, mm -hmm. where people are clicking these links on. So, for example, if I publish a newsletter, I'll put a link to it. Uh, if I publish a, a book review, I'll put it on my homepage. I'll put it on Facebook, Twitter, my discussion board, my blog. And over time, I can see where people are clicking from. Are they be, are, is it something that's been retweeted? Is it something that someone clicked on Facebook? Is it something that someone clicked on my newsletter? So not only can I see which platforms are working better, I can also see which type of content um, mm -hmm. my visitors people, and people who, to the, who are coming to the site are finding more interesting. So I can tailor my content based upon the things that people find most yeah. interesting based upon clicks. So it's, there's a, a, a volume of, of data that, that is very helpful in not only helping me understand what people find interesting, uh, but I use that information to, to you know, mm -hmm. supplement the content. And the same thing can be done with, with uh, you know, YouTube now. So many people are creating their own book trailers or just their own videos in general. Right. And you know, YouTube offers all that statistical information. So you can clearly see like, if you post a video on mosaicbooks.com or on ALBC, how effective, how effective it is and how much larger your audience can be. Uh, you know, again, up till like maybe two years ago, you advertised your book and you really weren't sure about the statistics. You know, you really weren't sure exactly how many people were seeing your book, how many people were really purchasing the book. But now we can, um, we can offer all these statistical information. And it's just made the uh, consumer, that's a, a much more educated consumer, yeah. which, which is, all, you know, in the end, that's like a perfect uh, kind of partnership. Yeah, I think that YouTube, the statistics that YouTube provide on videos has actually helped me sell my services. Because often you'll see a publisher or an author create a, a really terrific video, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. then you look at the uh, statistic, viewing statistics on YouTube and you see maybe 20 people have clicked the link or viewed it in the past, 20, in the past two months, all of them coming from their site. And, and you say to yourself, wow, they put all this money, time, resource into creating this really nice video, but no one's watching it. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
you know, I can, I'll tell someone, we have a service where you can have your video run embedded on virtually every AOBC.com page. And typically people who set those up will see hundreds of, of views come in quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's, that demonstrates quite clearly how, why it's important to, you know, to promote your own work through our, our mm -hmm. various platforms. Um, you, know, all, you know, when we get a video, the videos are embedded on our sites. And we also take advantage of the social media to put them out on Twitter, Twitter and Facebook. Facebook. So for example, um, so the ads are on the website and people will see them. But we also get that immediate kick from publish, posting on, on Facebook and Twitter. Mm -hmm. and, and, I get, and, I, and I assume because we're recognized names in the industry, you know, people come to trust what, what we promote and what we bring attention to yeah. on our various platforms. Excellent. Yeah, because you guys are also not just locally, but you're here across the, across the globe just about and there. International. Once right. you get on the web, mm -hmm. you know, the, the whole world is yours. And, you know, a lot of people don't, don't get that, you know, because mm -hmm. even though, uh, you know, it's 2010, we, we deal with like a lot of young authors who tweet and text and do everything all the time, but they don't realize the reach of the internet. This is, sure, it's an online bookstore, but it's not like the bookstore, you know, in Brooklyn or in the Bronx or Harlem. Mm -hmm. This is a bookstore that can be anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. I oftentimes get contacted by people um, in Europe, you know, and they ask a question like, well, will my book do well in America? Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you write a good book, it's going to do well. In a, except for translation, if you've mm -hmm. written it in Italian, you know. But if you write a good book, it's going to sell well anywhere. Right. And for, the, for that kind of investment, you know, it's, it's almost like a no-brainer. Because it, it takes a lot of money. If you're self-publisher, if you're a small publisher, it takes a lot of money to publish a book. So oftentimes, people will contact me I have a garage full of books. I don't know what to do next. <laughs> you know, <laughs> by then you you would hope that the person gave it a little bit more thought because right. by then it's really a struggle because now you got to ramp up your whole marketing promotion. But you know, ideally you don't even have to print a, like a, a garage full of books anymore. You can print just a box and print on demand as the books are needed. And, and when we can even feature books like that on our website now where the book is not printed at all until somebody orders it. You know, and even that is just a whole new way of thinking about what a bookstore is and how you can market. So you have your one book, Daryl Jenkins, Winbrook, Winbrook Pride Autobiography. Mm -hmm. You that. have no copies, <laughs> but you can sell that book. Because mm -hmm. we can tweet about it, you can shoot a YouTube video, uh, Facebook. Again, Troy mentioned Bitly and Stumble Upon. There, there's just so many avenues now for everyone to kind of take advantage of. Right. That is, it's just no reason not to kind of be focused in this social media uh, arena. Do you think a lot of people are taking advantage of it or, or, or misusing this social media, Troy, um, nowadays? Well, you know, anything online will be misused. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's, when, when I look at my email as an example, I would say 90% of the email I get is junk. Mm -hmm. And it's and that's not the stuff that actually makes it to my junk folder. The stuff that actually makes it to my inbox, mm -hmm. most of it is junk. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, because of that it it makes it hard to actually receive emails and read yeah, them in right. a timely fashion because yeah. there's so much to wade through. Um, Facebook, for example, is actually it's almost easy to contact me via Facebook because I will see that. I, I, I get a text to my phone that I got a Facebook message and I get far less, there's far less noise on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I'm only going to get, mess I can control who's sending me messages on Facebook. Um, so yeah, it, it will be abused. Anything that's online, there will be some person, company, entity who is going to try to take advantage of it for monetary gain. That, that's just the nature of humanity, I, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that makes my job difficult as the webmaster of AOBC.com is preventing people from spamming my discussion boards, for example. You know, if you leave something open, which is the easiest thing to do and the best thing to do, but if you leave something open, people will abuse it. People will post commercials and 
post all kinds of things that have nothing to do with the, our discussion. Mm -hmm. So if, then if you put up, um, if you force people to register now, um, there are spam bots that kind of come in, set up a, a dummy registration, fill out all the fields, and then start spamming you again. Mm -hmm. uh, one board actually had to take down because I just could not prevent um, people from spamming. So I upgraded the software. Now we can use a Facebook login. Yeah. So in yeah. my discussion board, <clears throat> if you have a Facebook account, you can come in and log in and start contributing, posting to the boards. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to worry about validating who you are because Facebook has done that. And we, we're seeing a lot of that also. Yeah. On my website now, when I publish a book review, I, I, there's, pe there's people can comment on those book reviews. But they can, they can comment using their Twitter ID, their Facebook ID, their uh, Gmail ID. I don't have to keep track of who they are. Yeah. They can log in. You don't have to worry about trying to read some crazy code, you know, <laughs> that will that capture code. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually, th those tools are helping to make uh, the internet a, actually a, a better place in yeah. a lot of ways. A more accessible place also, uh, because like I said earlier, like 400 million people, there has to be a low threshold of entry to get 400 million people to participate. But the great thing about Facebook is all 400 million people must register to use it. So it's not, at least keep my fingers crossed, <laughs> you know, there's, there's no kind of um, environment of spamming <coughs> excuse me, on, on Facebook yet, you know, to any kind of large degree. So that kind of helps keep those communities kind of clean and um, and just, you know, yeah, but whole. Now actually, go back to your point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing that we have to be aware of, and, you know, I don't know what's going to happen ultimately, but when you look at companies like Facebook and you look at the volume of information they have about, about those 400 million people, mm -hmm. um, you know, information that we freely contribute. Mm -hmm. right. they, Facebook knows who our friends are, right. what schools we've right. gone to, where mm -hmm. we've worked, yes. what we're talking about, what yeah. we like, mm -hmm. um, you know, all this stuff. And, and surely they will use it in ways so. that we perhaps were, we hadn't considered. Right. You know, even with Google, Google, if you sign up with their toolbar, they got a tremendous amount of information about you. Mm -hmm. They know where you go, what sites you visit, what uh, they, you know, they claim they don't know the individuals, but they have the data. You know, not only that, they they're yeah, copying the internet on a regular basis. IP address, they can basically track you to your computer. Right. So, right. so they you yeah. know, they know where you're going, they know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, what what are these companies going to do with this information? Mm -hmm. How is it going to be used? Is it always going to be used to benefit us? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's funny because the, the the reason why I brought that up, I seen it on the news, and Chuck Schumer was talking about it. But the other thing is, is that it could be used in law enforcement. A lot of times, people committing yeah. crimes. You know, there's there's mm -hmm. cyber crimes too. Yeah, so you got to remember with the cyber crimes, the you know, and technology, yeah. the police have to stay a step ahead. Yeah. And in order for them to do that, they have to have all these companies cooperate with them because a lot of times they won't. They they, they find ways to use it for themselves. Right. Well, 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 that's mm -hmm. the that's the problem. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, and I'm suggesting that I, I I don't feel comfortable trusting anyone with all of that information. I mean, the only thing that you could do to avoid is to just opt out of yeah. all of this right. stuff. Right. Um, and people are actually doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, er, er, you know, I tell people all the time, everybody shouldn't be on Facebook. There are some people who have perhaps done things. Mm -hmm. there, you know, there are a lot of classic stories of people who post uh, new pictures of, of their girlfriend because they're pissed off at her. And yeah, right. you can take it down or untag yourself, mm -hmm. but once it's there, it's there. And it's never, go yeah. it's never going away. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you can't get rid of this stuff once it's out there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, so companies are using uh, these social media to look for things about perspective or even current employees. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, you're, you, you can't be free online. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right. you should, one should be able to do whatever they want to in their, in their social media. True. But you shouldn't have to worry about one big brother 
at your corporate gig, mm -hmm. looking over and making sure what you do doesn't impose upon in your in your in your free time mm -hmm. doesn't you know make the company look bad potentially, or you don't want to worry about some law form enforcement official having access to your data and using it for ways that or using it for reasons that have nothing to do with law enforcement. Right. Uh, you know. If people have access to data, it, it will there will be opportunity for it to be abused, and history tells us things like this will be abused. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, even now, before social media became kind of integrated into our lives, um, you know, if you go to a website that serves Google Ad um, AdWords, which is their kind of advertising program, mm -hmm. they will serve you ads based on your interests. Um, right now, it's so in it's so interesting that when I'm surfing, me personally, Ron Kavanaugh, when I'm surfing around the net, an ad for Timbuktu, not to give them a promotion, Timbuktu mm -hmm. bags mm -hmm. pops up on almost every website that I go to that serves Google AdWords. Mm -hmm. And what they know is that I went to Timbuktu's website. So somehow through a cookie on my computer that right. they put there, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of like a little tracking code. Right. Um, they know if they're serving an ad, I was looking at a bag, so they're going to serve an ad that I'm going to see for a bag. So I see a 300 by 250 square. Mm -hmm. I see the horizontal. I see right. the banner. Almost every site that I go to that serves uh, yeah. Google Ads. Yeah. And the same thing with Amazon. Yeah. Well, anything you, else. You, I mean, I get cookies all the time. It, right. And it drives me crazy. I try yeah. and get them off my computer, and, they, you, you know, by the end of the yeah. night, you got um, 30, 40 cookies on yeah. there if you're on there for a long time. Yeah, they, they, these companies are so bright, and, and, and it's, <laughs> it's really mm -hmm. an astonishing the kind of things that they're, mm -hmm. they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can, going back to my typical content of a book review, I can post a book review about, some, and the, there'll be some subject matter in the book review. And as soon as I post it, the next ad that comes up on mm -hmm. a brand new page <coughs> is relevant to the content of that page. Right. And, and as Ron suggested, not only are they tying ads to the page contents, they're tying ads to your surfing habits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really remarkable what they're right. doing. But you know, in a way, it kind of benefits us also because if a, if a per, if we, we, we serve Google Ads, so if mm -hmm. a person visits our website, we have a book, if they buy one of those other books, you know, we also get, you know, it works like on a percentage basis. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it's kind of like at this point where it's like good and evil kind of working together and we really can't make any clear choices about it. Mm -hmm. Not to say that serving ads is a bad thing, you right. know, encouraging people to, to purchase items is a bad thing. But we're benefiting from it to a certain extent, you know, and we kind of have to, like, come to that conclusion well, that... Well, that's the business model, right? Yeah. I mean, these ads are subsidized, pay for what we do. Yeah. Right. I yeah. mean, so, you know, there are... Every book on AOBC.com is not a paid ad. There are some books that I'm excited about or that I've learned about through a positive, a fav very favorable review that I will go out and promote even if the author or publisher is not interested in promoting it. So, um, and I'm able to do that because Google, you know, the ads, my leftover inventory of ads go, goes to Google, mm -hmm. and Google pays a, a, a pretty penny uh, for that inventory. So ultimately, what I would like to be able to do is provide everything for free and just work, you know, pay for everything through, through ads, right. um, ad sales. But um, so far, it's not quite there yet. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, it's very, very possible. So yeah, these just like in the old traditional model of selling newspaper ads, mm -hmm. we're selling ads online. But the benefit of these ads online are that they're highly targeted, as as Ron suggested, and they're metrics. You know, for example, if you buy an ad on AOBC.com, depending on the type of ad you buy, I can tell you how many times the ad was viewed, how many times it was clicked. And if you give me the ability to put code on your website, I can tell you how many times someone transacted. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of information that, you know, some of the clients that I work with, for example, we experiment with different types of ads, long, long horizontal ads, skyscraper, vertical ads, square ads, video ads, mm -hmm. book covers. 
and, and we look at what's doing best and we, you know, we look at what's doing best and, and focus on those types of ads. You know, what ads work better, where, colors, the whole, the whole nine. So there's a lot of opportunity because of this technology and because of the data that we have. Mm -hmm. We can, the, the, the information that we have allows us to be, do much better um, with reaching our audience. And what, what's so interesting, Troy and I, even though we have separate companies, we're, we're still basically like small one, one person operations, but we operate as big as any other, company, any other company on the internet because of all this social media now, because of the metrics that we can provide to customers. And we can mm -hmm. clearly say, like, sure, your book is on Amazon, but who's seeing your book on Amazon? Mm -hmm. You know, you really need to get your book uh, in the face of your readers. And until you do that, your book is going to be on Amazon and it's going to sell two copies on Amazon. Mm -hmm. You know, so when somebody comes to Mosaic Books or ALBC, we're telling them, yeah, we'll tweet to a thousand people and, you know, we'll list a book on Facebook to, you know, an additional thousand or so people. Right. And, and I think that it's starting, like, you know, people are really starting to realize that, you know, these these different kind of social media, for lack of a better word, because uh, some of them aren't really that social. I don't know about Twitter <laughs> as far as, you know, how social it is. Right. But um, all these different tools are just integral to you promoting your book and your book doing well. And if you don't take them seriously, you really can't sell a book. Because, I mean, I love bookstores. Don't get me wrong. I don't think there's anything better than a table in a bookstore that has, like, 30 books that you've never seen before and you walk in the front door and there they are. There's nothing like that. Mm -hmm. There's no serendipity on the internet yet that can replace a table full of books like when you walk into uh, McNally Jackson or Brownstone Books and there's somebody there to hand sell a book to you. Right. But there's, the audience is so large on the internet that you just, you have to take it seriously first uh, and foremost. And, you know, bookstores are now secondary, yeah. but important. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the biggest comments that I got from my website when I first started it. Which was when? I, the, I first started working on the site in 1997, mm -hmm. and I launched it officially on its own domain in, in March of 1998. Uh, but immediately people were calling, emailing me and saying, oh, this is so great. There are no let alone not no independent bookstores, there are no bookstores in my community. If it wasn't for this site, I would not have learned about this book, that author. And, and to you know, these were people who were, who were just chomping at the bit, uh, an untapped market of mm -hmm. people who desired this type of content but had no way of, of discovering it. Mm -hmm. They just simply did not live anywhere they can buy this material. Yeah. And so that, um, you know, so, Again, independent bookstores, are t all bookstores are terrific, but everyone doesn't, li you know, they're not like Walmarts where 85% right. of the country lives 25 miles from Walmart. <laughs> you know, most people don't, you know, mm -hmm. how many bookstores are there in the Bronx, for example? You know, yes. there's a big Barnes & Noble in Co-op City. And there's and one little bookstore in the Bronx. There's one independent bookstore to serve uh, 1.3 million? 1. million people. Yeah. Wow. You know, when you think about that. Right. Well, how many people have personal computers in their home now? That's true. So your bookstore is right, you know. Yeah, absolutely. we didn't have that before. Exactly. Uh, and also, too, I think the library, I did a story with the library, and the library also is having trouble getting kids reading books. Yeah. You know, I, I, we, ha we put together an essay for Juneteenth, and we're having trouble getting kids to write essays. So, yeah. you know, w we have to generate a lot more interest, and in learning has to be fun. Yeah, you yeah. Know? You know, one of the things I do, I also run a nonprofit called the Literary Freedom Project, mm -hmm. and we're really trying to get professional development to educators. Right. What took uh, you so long to talk about it? I, I, I need, <laughs> got to bring me back for another yeah, show. Yeah, we got to bring you back. <laughs> All definitely, right, look, definitely. I'm sorry, our time is okay. run out. Um, I'll give you information one more time, Troy uh, Johnson. Troy Johnson, president and founder of the African American Literature Book Club, AALBC.com. Okay. Ron Cavanaugh. I'm Ron Cavanaugh, um, president of MosaicBooks.com. Uh, in the literary? The Literary Freedom Project is a nonprofit. Um, we do professional development for teachers, trying to get them to um, know how to assign reading assignments in the classroom. 
just so we can kind of increase literacy and a love of literature and culture. All right, see, that's another show, Ron. There you go. All right, look, I want to thank both of you gentlemen for being a part of thank Winbrook you, Pride. Thank you. Uh, keep up the good work. Thanks. All right. All right. And cool. uh, thank you once again. All right, I hope that you will continue to watch Winbrook.